Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest iteration of The Pitch. This is one of my favorite shows to host because we have a stock picking showdown with three experts providing their top picks, charts that are top of mind for them. I'm Dave Keller, the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com, and we have three fantastic uh, experts for you today. Here's how things are going to work. I'm going to introduce all three of them. They're going to each have about seven minutes or so to present their five stock picks. They can be stocks, ETFs, whatever they like. They're going to uh, make their pitch to you, explaining why they think it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a good chart right about now. At the end, we'll ask some questions, have a discussion about what we picked and what we did not pick, see what we can uncover for all of you. Let's welcome on our three experts today. I'm super excited because I know each of them individually, and I would say they are, uh, you, you are in very good hands in terms of their expertise and the, uh, the technical analysis capabilities they'll bring to bear. We have Aaron Swemlin, uh, who's the Vice President of Decision Point. We have Mary Ellen McGonigal, Senior, Senior Managing Director of Stocks at Simpler Trading and founder of MEM Investments. And finally, we have Danielle Shea, the Vice President of Options at Simpler Trading. Aaron, Mary Ellen, Danielle, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to the pitch. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. So I, again, I've known each of you in your work for a while, and I'm, I'm super excited because I think of you all as very capable stock pickers. When you bring examples with you, they're stocks, they're charts that I wish I would have found on my own a lot of times because you bring things and I'm like, oh, why didn't I find that? So I'm, I'm super excited to see what stocks you've brought. I know our viewers are, are as well. This is as the S&P is trading just above 4,200 here on May 27th. So overall, we are pretty close to all-time highs. But the question is, do we continue to push higher or do we chop around here a little further? Let's get it started. We're going to start Mary Ellen with you today. So I have your, uh, your picks here. Let's start with chart number one. We're going to go with CrowdStrike Holdings. Yeah, you bet. I thought I'd give a little bit of background before jumping into my stock picks. And what I'm doing right now is sharing with you stocks that at this moment look quite attractive. We're in a period now where Certainly, the, as Dave mentioned, markets are close to hitting a new high, but also we are and have been chopping around, certainly because there's a lot of cross currents in the way of economic numbers and how investors are interpreting that relative to interest rates, inflation, and so forth. So at this juncture, I am focused on, I have a lot of stocks in my MEM Edge report that are in those cyclical areas. Right now I'm looking at areas that have underperformed over the last month, but are, uh, are showing signs of life. So that will lead me to technology as well as uh, consumer discretionary stocks. So first up in tech, we're looking at CrowdStrike, CRWD. This is a cybersecurity uh, software stock and it has everything to do with a great improvement among corporations in their budget for cybersecurity to defend against attacks. We've seen a lot of attacks this year, major corporations. We're looking at a daily price chart and we can see that CRWD did sell off in line with other software stocks, but more recently, it has broken back above those shorter term simple moving averages and we can see that the RSI and the MACD, that MACD just now turning positive. Another item of note is that CRWD, if you were to compare this to other software stocks, it is what I call first out of the gate, the first among a handful, there are over 200 software stocks that have turned bullish, that have reversed the recent downturn. And historically that sets this stock up to be a leadership name among software stocks. So that's first up. Very good. Chart number two, Dick Sporting Goods. Yeah, now these guys, this is a stock that I know very well. Uh, subscribers to my MEM Edge report will know this name. They did report explosive earnings. No other word for it. Yesterday, we can see the stock gapped up. It closed the day up about 13%. And take a look at that volume up 600% above average. That's telling me there is further upside ahead for the stock. 
Also, when you see these stocks gap up and in that process break out of the base, that is super bullish. And we can see that both the RSI and the MACD, those outside momentum indicators are positive. I also have an intraday chart, uh, if we can get to that, but it is going to be very helpful as far as guiding you in, uh, through super near-term possibilities. Uh, I would use an intraday chart. And then also as precedent, we can look at another retailer, PLCE, Children's Place, another one that gapped up out of the base on strong earnings. And you can see how the stock got pushed into this very nice uptrend out of that gap up base breakout. Very, very good. Chart number three, we're looking at LGI Homes, so transitioning to homeowners. Yes. Is this going to be another consumer discretionary stock? We've seen housing. It's been a bit bumpy along the way. Certainly lumber prices, other considerations are coming into play. But LGIH is really set up to be a, a winner. I do think housing stocks, they do well in periods of recovery where it's historically low interest rates. Uh, we're seeing lumber prices drop uh, this week. But more importantly, when looking at stocks, you're going to want to know trends as far as housing and what's taking place across the country. And a lot of it has to do with millennials, age 25 to 40. These are the power, uh, the buyers, actually. A lot of them coming in, purchasing their first home. And this is precisely what LGIH focuses on, those that are going from renting into the first home. Also, a lot of trends as it relates to where people are moving into the Southwest. That's where LGIH uh, specializes. The company did recently report explosive earnings, pulled back in line with the group. But again, we're seeing that nice downtrend reversal, breaking back above those shorter term simple moving averages. Uh, I would really be interested if we get a nice base breakout above that 187 area. Uh, we can also see that the RSI is positive. Take a look at that MACD down at the bottom. We're going to want to see that black line cross up through the red, that nice bullish uh, momentum re uh, downtrend reversal. So uh, lots of good things happening here. Decent chart for sure. Chart number four, Overstock. Yeah, now Overstock, many of you know them as a ret uh, online retailer, certainly in furnishings and so forth, a big winner out of the pandemic. The company just reported super strong numbers, uh, triple digit year over year earnings growth. But OSTK has another piece to their puzzle, if you will. Uh, the ticker symbol OSTKO, the company got uh, FINRA approval at the end of last year. They are a cryptocurrency uh, broker, and they also can do investment banking and help these crypto firms raise capital. So you're kind of getting a double bang out of this stock. And we can see today the stock is breaking out of a nice one month base. And we do have those nice outside momentum indicators trending positively. You know, it's interesting. I was, my initial reaction, we're going to get through all of the stock picks here in a minute, but my initial reaction was none of us picked anything crypto related, but I think you've, you've now qualified that. I think we've, I think we've done it. We got there with, uh, with Overstock. I did it. Finally, RH, Restoration Hardware. What's this one look like? <laughs> Okay, yeah, Restoration Hardware, they are due to report earnings in two weeks, that's important to note. But also of note is the fact that Wall Street analysts are raising guidance going into earnings. And historically, this is a very bullish uh, occurrence. These analysts aren't gonna put their neck on the line unless they have real confidence and maybe a little more knowledge than we might have. So the stock is poised to turn bullish. We're not quite there yet, a break above that pink 21 day Simple moving average would have me even more constructive. Of note, uh, Berkshire Hathaway is an owner, and he did recently increase his stake in RH, one of only four stocks that he did so. The company is expanding globally. They're going over to Paris, to the UK, and they are really have had exceptional triple digit earnings, and they guided higher as far as their revenue outlook. So the stock found nice support at that 50 day simple moving average. And then a little more work needs to be done with that MACD and that RSI uh, poised to turn positive. That's fantastic. Five great uh, stocks, Mary Ellen. We're gonna show very quickly the, uh, the summary of what you did. So you have one in technology, four consumer discretionary stocks, two with sort of a home construction theme, two with more of a, uh, a retail theme, and then one software name on there. So one follow-up question, right? When you mentioned with 
restoration hardware you mentioned with some of the others right around earnings as being a driver. And I know, again, from following you and your experiences at places like O'Neill, being very familiar with the relationship between charts and earnings, does it make you, does it concern you analyzing a chart leading up to earnings? Uh, do the charts become more or less valuable around an, around an earnings release? How do you think about that relationship real quick, if you yeah, could? That, that's a great question. For me, it's gonna be all about history. The stocks that I've highlighted have recently uh, posted solid explosive earnings and also management guiding higher. That's gonna be a critical component mm -hmm. in each of those stocks. I will not buy stocks within days of reporting, but certainly two weeks out would, uh, if we see like, as for instance, in our H turn bullish, I will uh, buy the stock. Fantastic. And you mentioned, I think one of the, the best comments you made was just be aware a company reporting earnings. I think a lot of times awareness more than anything is pretty important. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. Uh, Aaron Swedlin, thank you so much for joining us uh, as well. You're the vice president of Decision Point. It's so good to have you joining us today. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Got some so great we have, yeah, we have your five charts ready up. There's a bit of a theme, I think, with some of these uh, some of these stocks that you've picked up. We're going to start with ACB. Talk us through this one. All right. Well, right now I'm really uh, pro weed stocks, marijuana <laughs> stocks. Uh, Congress is getting ready to introduce a bill that will legalize it throughout the country. It will take it off schedule one. And it's going to also allow the Veterans Administration to, um, to prescribe medical marijuana to the veterans as well. So this is an area that is going to see some major growth, in my opinion. And so I brought two rather low price stocks that I think is, are just going to offer us some great opportunity to the upside. So the first one is Aurora Cannabis. And you can see we have that nice falling wedge pattern, which is bullish, of course. And we also see that breakout now to the upside, which is exactly what we would expect coming out of one of these patterns. And I love that that five-day EMA is crossed above the 20-day EMA. And now we're seeing price right there uh, above those two key moving averages on this breakout. You can see that the RSI is positive, which I love. And we also have uh, my price momentum oscillator, the PMO. This is similar to the MACD and the PPO, but it's something that Decision Point developed. We like it better than both of those. And you can see that we do have that positive crossover buy signal in oversold territory. So this one is really poised to do well. The only caveat I would say is that when the 50-day EMA is that far below the 200-day EMA, we have to be a little careful because Clearly, this one's been beat down. We want to make sure that it continues higher. But, you know, if we can get just up to that November top, that's a 70% gain on this stock. And I always put a stop level. And in this case, I have one that's a little bit deep at 10.5%, but mainly because of the volatility and the low price of this stock. I think you kind of have to, to deepen that stock. Very good. One. Chart number two, staying in the same group, CLVR. Yes. Clever Leaves International, and this is a very similar chart with, for weed. It has an even better upside potential. We have the falling wedge again. We have the breakout above that 50-day EMA. We have the 5- and 20-day EMA positive crossover. And then I did set a stop that's about 9.8%, um, comes up to those tops mid-May. So I think that that's a pretty good set. Uh, the RSI is positive, and of course, we had that PMO crossing above its signal line in oversold territory. Again, really nice setup. And then I've also put on the very bottom that relative to the S&P, this stock's really starting to outperform as well. So I'm expecting these marijuana stocks to do very, very well coming up. And I think they're going to be a pretty good long-term uh, hold, honestly, once we make sure that this breakout is for real. Interesting. And this is a group, obviously, that's been underperforming for quite a while. It's pretty pretty interesting to see these stocks now starting to outperform a little bit. Now, chart number three, transitioning a bit into more of a travel theme, we have Marriott, M-A-R. Yes, absolutely. Um, like this one going into the summer, we have another falling wedge. We have a nice breakout from a short-term double bottom. Um, price has gotten bo uh, above both the 5- and 20-day EMAs. 
And you can see that five-day EMA is just crossed above the 20-day EMA. That's a short-term trend model buy signal for us. RSI is positive. We are seeing a little bit of a pullback today, which honestly I think offers a, an even better entry. We have a positive OBV divergence on balance volume. When you start seeing rising bottoms on the OBV, and then you match those to declining bottoms, that's a positive divergence. And then of course you can see that PMO has just crossed above its signal line, again, in oversold territory. So I think this one is shaped up to look, uh, to get us some upside potential. Right now I've listed it at 11.1%, but that's up to all time highs. And there's certainly room for it to move higher than that. Chart number four, service now, NOW switching to the technology sector now. Yes, which is the leader. And of course, we're looking at a pretty uh, nice breakout here currently with the S&P 500. We are seeing a bit of a pullback on this one, but it's holding above that support level that matches up with those November lows and some of those March lows. So I think that's a really important area of support. Now, overall, in the intermediate term, you can see that we might have a double bottom that is starting here. And that would mean a break above that confirmation line, which is drawn right through the middle of those tops in April. So that's your confirmation line. And the expectation of the double bottom, of course, is a breakout from that confirmation line, but also an upside potential or upside minimum upside target that is the height of the pattern currently in that double bottom. So I really like the look of this one. You've got an RSI, it's not quite positive yet, but you know, we had the pullback today, so it, it makes some sense that we would see that. And again, pullbacks are great. <laughs> Those offer some great entries. The PMO you can see down there has that positive crossover buy signal. Marriott set up really well going into the summer. Very good. And finally, we have Sonos, S-O-N-O. I love Sonos. I have their products all through my house and they just introduced, um, they had their radio that they introduced, but they've recently introduced a small portable Sonos speaker that you can take with you and take around and the sound quality on those uh, products are great. RSI is now just getting positive. You can see that price is breaking above the 20 day EMA, looking forward to it getting above the 50 day EMA based on that lovely PMO crossover buy signal, I think we're set up pretty well to at least get to the top of that current trading level zone. And that's a 20% gain just to get there. And certainly Sonos, I think is set up, it could move even higher than that. So love Sonos. It's a great set of picks. Just to review the five that you brought with you, uh, Aaron. We have five stocks, two in the cannabis space, ACB and CLVR. We have one consumer discretionary uh, name, MAR, and then two, stock, uh, two technology stocks, ServiceNow and Sonos. I'm curious, Aaron, as you were talking, I thought you did a great job of illustrating on the chart sort of the risk versus the reward, right? Sort of the downside, uh, you know, your stop loss of where you do it. Can you just talk briefly about how do you generally come up with those stop loss levels? Is it a, a, a function of volatility? Is it using support and resistance levels? What's your general thought for that? Well, first of all, I typically will set a stop between eight and 10% at the most. Um, and what I do when I present my decision point diamonds in my blog is I always want that stop level. It kind of covers my butt as well as yours. <laughs> and so I usually will pick it right at about a support or resistance level that I can, can uh, discern. But sometimes, you know, when you get an 8% mover, you're gonna have to set that stop a little bit lower or maybe um, not be able to get to those uh, support and uh, resistance levels. But typically I try to get just below a support level if possible. Perfect, Aaron, thank you so much. Those are five great picks. We're gonna come back and talk a little bit more about those in a moment. I wanna to get to our third expert, Danielle Shea. Danielle's the Vice President of Options at Simpler Trading, a frequent guest host of uh, Your Daily Five here on Stock Charts TV. Danielle, great to see you and thanks for coming on today. Yes, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here with this group of amazing people. <laughs> Some uh, fantastic investors and technical analysts here. And you, of course, uh, very much have a seat at that table. You've brought five charts with you, starting with an ETF hack. Talk us through this one. 
So generally when I'm looking for big moves to last, you know, over the span of six to nine months, let's say, I usually like to start with an ETF and I really like this ETF hack. It's the cybersecurity ETF. As you can see on the chart, um, you're really consolidating around the, between the 54 to $58 price point. Um, that consolidation, I'm looking for that consolidation to break out in the direction of the trend up to about the 70 to 75 price point. Uh, not only does it have a good technical setup, but also I think on a macro fundamental level, cybersecurity mean it's it's becoming ever more in focus. You also have the Biden administration that is going to be, I'm not exactly sure what they're doing yet, but they are going to be working on some cybersecurity initiatives just due to um, the hack that happened with the pipe, the pipeline. And um, I think that cybersecurity, especially in our increasingly tech, technical, technological world, um, is just going to be really strong here for years to come. So number one, I like just investing in the ETF overall. Um, but then I also like to break that down and look at individual stocks. So I really liked uh, Mary Ellen's CrowdStrike pick. Actually, it's one of my favorite ones. Um, but the next chart that I have is going to be Cloudflare. So this is a company that our company actually uses. Um, so I'm a little bit familiar with them, but also I love this chart because of the overall technical pattern. So if you can see, you know, on the weekly chart, you have a really nice pattern of higher highs, higher lows. Uh, last summer, it especially took off. And right now, what we've seen, you know, over the course of the past couple months, there's been inflationary fears. You've seen the NASDAQ uh, pull back and consolidate. You've seen tech overall pull back and consolidate. And so have all of these cybersecurity stocks. So you're seeing that consolidation here in Cloudflare as well. So, you know, it's consolidating around the 62 to 65 price point. And what I'm looking for with this one is I'm looking for an ultimate breakout to about 105. Maybe we can get 115. That would be amazing. This is obviously a more volatile stock, a high momentum type name. So when you're trading these kind of names, you really have to learn to sit through the punches like we've seen the past couple months. But I think we have a really great entry right here. Um, Star number three, staying in technology, we have Microsoft. Yeah, so Microsoft is just one of my absolute favorite long-term buys. Um, this talk is really consistent. They show consistent quarter over quarter, year over year growth. They have a variety of different product segments that are all growing, which is amazing. They're, they, ever since they shifted their model from, you know, remember when they used to sell those actual CDs, windows, <laughs> stuff like that. But ever, ever since they um, shifted to a cloud-based model, um, they've just really seen explosive growth. And what I really like about Microsoft is that, you know, Apple gets all the attention, Tesla gets all the attention, but there's Microsoft in the background, just slow and steady. Microsoft never really seems to get hit by bad news. Um, they don't have supply chain issues. It's mostly all like software as a service type thing. Um, so I like this one and I like it to trade from the current levels around 250 up into about 270. Very good. Now, finally, we stick within technology, but transitioning to semiconductors. Yeah. So, I mean, I love semiconductors because, you know, like cybersecurity, we're in an increasingly technological world. Okay. And the more and more technology there, there is, the more semiconductors that we need. Like we know right now, there's a current semiconductor shortage that's impacting a wide variety of businesses. And this has kept a damper on the semiconductor industry as a whole. But what you have to remember is that's not going to last forever. If you look back to the volatility that we saw in the semiconductors during the trade war, I mean, they had massive sell-offs, but they continue to end up higher. So I'm looking for the semiconductor shortage to actually give us a buying opportunity here um, and then add more shares of, you know, I like SMH. I also like Soxel, the 3X ETF. Um, and then the next one that I really like is Taiwan Semiconductors. So this one, really strong weekly chart pattern. Um, you can see you have a really nice pullback right here. A little bit of a cup and handle pattern there. You have that consolidation as well. And I'm looking for that one to break out to about 150. So when I'm buying stocks like this, you know, generally I will also invest in the ETF. So, I mean, I have a position in SMH that I continually add to when I get these nice pullbacks. Um, I do like to also trade the leverage uh, ETF a little bit more aggressively. 
but I also like to add stocks like this. So I've been adding this, you know, over the course of the past couple months. Um, and we may not see the semiconductor shortage resolve itself in, you know, the next one or two or three months even. Um, but if you look back a year, two years from now, I think that all of these semiconductor stocks are ultimately going to be higher. These are five great charts. And I think glancing quickly through the list, um, Daniel, you may be, have been the only one to bring a Seattle based company. So thank you for that, uh, that gift to, uh, to us here at Stock Charts. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the original boxes of the software. As you, as you probably know, Chip Anderson, our founder, was one of the original Windows programmers. So in our office, we have some of those prominently located in a uh, display case, some of the early versions of it. You mentioned a couple of times, uh, you know, especially with the semiconductors, you mentioned the Soxel, right? The, the, the levered ETF. Mm -hmm. Can you just speak briefly between, you know, if you have something like semiconductors, what would inform your opinion on whether to just hold the SMH or the SOXX or something that's very, you know, just a plain vanilla exposure versus the levered? Is it a measurement of risk? Is it just a, 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 a measurement of a time frame where you use the leverage on short term versus long term? How do you think about when to pull which lever? So I think it's really a, I think it's really a measure of kind of intestinal fortitude because the, <laughs> well, well, first of all, I mean, I primarily trade options. So to me, you know, uh, the leverage that I have in options is not, it, it's going to be more than what you're looking at with the leverage ETF. So I kind of look at it on kind of a step up basis. You know, if you're, if you're wanting to get exposure to the semiconductors and, you know, you don't think you can really manage a lot of volatility because the semis and the, and the cloud stocks and the cybersecurity stocks, these are volatile spaces. So if you know that it's going to drive you nuts to get in a position and see it go up and down with all of these news related events, then it's much better to focus on SMH because that is going to be, you know, <laughs> the, the easiest path higher because it's an average, right? Um, if you, in fact, say, well, you know, I like the nicer, easier path of just trading the basic ETF, but I want to get a little bit more exposure here. I don't mind if this position is up or down 10% in a day or maybe for several days in a row because that happens. Um, you know, try out some shares of Soxel. And then if you really want to focus on one semiconductor company, that's when you can break it down to a specific company. But, you know, we know with the semiconductors that there's been a lot of issues. There's been supply chain issues um, with the pandemic overall. We've had trade war issues with China. And so when you're exposed to just one specific company, you know, it is a lot more involved. So generally I tell people, you know, based on how comfortable you are with risk, that's how I determine it. As far as time frame, usually with a leverage ETF, you can go a little bit shorter on the time frame to trade it a little bit more versus just holding it. But I think all three are great buy and hold options. Perfect. So let's look very quickly at what you all uh what you all provided, what you all brought with you and doing a quick glance as you were talking, I came up with out of 15 stocks or ETFs that you suggested, we had eight in technology, we had five in consumer discretionary and two in healthcare, but that's kind of healthcare with an asterisk, Aaron, because they're, they're cannabis stocks. I don't know if I group them with pharma, but they certainly come in the healthcare sector. So, you know, it strikes me that as a group, we're pretty bullishly positioned. I mean, we're positioned for the market going higher, we're positioned for a structural uptrend that's going to elevate these growth stock. We're positioned for interest rates most likely staying muted, which would be a tailwind for the growth trade. So my question to all of you just to start with is, does that reflect an overall bearish sentiment that you see that you are bullish on the market and therefore these are the stocks that look attractive? Or is it more of a bottom-up exercise and it just is interesting that growthy sectors and stocks are the ones that come up naturally in your process. Who wants to start with the response to that? I can certainly start and say that with my work, definitely growth oriented. I was brought up in that environment. That's where I'm gonna be drawn toward. However, more recently, it's only been recently that I've re-embraced these growthier names, particularly within technology. I had a lot of big triple digit winners in those semis in software last year, but you have to honor the chart and they peaked in February, sold off, but they are currently coming back into favor, which is very good. It doesn't mean that I ignored the move into cyclicals. I have a number of uh, industrial, financial, 
and energy names on my suggested holdings list for my MEM Edge report, but this is talking about current action and what looks interesting now. It's interesting because Aaron, you had a similar idea. A lot of the stocks you were suggesting were ones that were sort of in those wedge patterns, sort of actionable pullbacks within an uptrend, right? Absolutely. I love chart patterns. Anybody knows me, uh, I know Mary Ellen on our chart wise women, we do lots of chart patterns on my charts. Uh, you know, for me, I, you, we do at decision point, we start at really top level in terms of understanding what's going on with the S and P because knowing that is half the battle. You know, you want to be in the trend, whatever the trend is. If the market is overbought, you need to be a little bit more uh, careful about what you choose. So in general, I like to look at what's going on in the market. And right now, our indicators say that short term is still looking really good. I'm expecting new all time highs. After that, I'm a little bit mm, intermediate term. My inter indicators are still a little soft. So I'm not so sure we're going to, it'll last once we get up there. Um, so I, I look at the overall trend of the market. And then the next thing I do is I run all my scans to find my diamond in the, my diamonds in the rough <laughs> for my blog. And so in that regard, it's almost kind of bottom up. But mm. I'm looking at, you know, based on what the market's doing, you know, whether I want to be in something more aggressive. And right now with the market going up, technology leads the market. I mean, you have to have some technology names in there right now. And we've got plenty of ideas from today. Danielle, when you're looking at a chart of the S&P, are you seeing constructive pattern? And how does that relate to the picks? Is it a macro to micro call? Is it mixed? How would you describe it? So I definitely um, agree with Mary Ellen and Aaron for sure. I mean, really on every single point that they said. Um, when I'm looking at the S&P overall, I do have a $4,300 price target. Um, you know, I think that seasonally in the fall, we do typically see a little bit of a pullback, a little bit of a correction. I think it's a little bit too early to kind of put that out there for sure right now. Um, but I do anticipate the market being strong June through July. I mean, seasonally, we have a uh, run into earnings going on. You know, we have major earnings really at the end of July. Um, and that typically gives the market a pretty nice boost. And then after the core, you know, tech companies report earnings and stuff like that, that's when I typically start to see some market weakness in August. So I'm looking for that, you know, in the near term, but when you're talking about, you know, focusing on technology and all these high growth stocks, I mean, I just see no reason not to, whenever I'm looking to trade something, I always want the most bang for my buck. Um, hmm. I'm the first to admit, I'm not really great about, you know, picking up materials stocks and energy stocks. And I really do like to focus on the areas of the market that um, are showing that high growth. And I mean, to me, that all comes back to earnings. So I like to look at, mm -hmm. you know, what these companies are doing quarter over quarter, year over year. And as long as they're still, you know, especially this year, this year was absolutely insane, right? And still these companies like last quarter was what the strongest earnings quarter that we've had since what year? I can't, I can't remember the exact stat, but it was incredibly strong growth. Yeah. Um, and so I just don't really see any reason to focus anywhere else other than these kind of high growth names. It's very, very interesting. And I'm, as I'm thinking of what you guys picked, you know, you know, what did we pick? We picked a lot of technology, a lot of consumer discretionary. So what did we not pick? And a couple of you mentioned some of the cyclical sectors, things like materials, no gold stocks in there, which I, I you'd have to be fairly defensive to be throwing Newmont Mining or Kinross. So I get that. I'm okay with that. Um, industrials, but financials, none of you mentioned uh, either. And I'm curious, you know, some of the charts within um, uh, financials have had essentially had incredible runs and are, and are continuing to make new highs. We're looking at Royal Bank of Canada, RY on the, uh, on the screen right now. So my question to all of you, you know, we've had this situation where we've had a rising rate environment, which has been a huge tailwind to banks, global banks, regional banks, sort of everything's been up. Are you, when you look at a chart like RY, is it something that you would think it is more of an interest rate play. And if interest rates come down, that's a risk to, to be owning something. Or is it more of a, these have had already quite, quite a, a run. And based on your work, we've sort of already seen the move. And now it's a rotation back to growth. Or would you be comfortable still holding something like an RY or, and again, I mean, most financials I could bring up kind of look like this. Um, you know, how would you think of the financial space, especially if you hold it now? Is this something you are concerned about? Or do you ride these trends further? 
Yeah, I, I actually picked up a lot of those bank stocks. If you look at FITB, for instance, I put it on the, my suggested holdings list back in November and three other uh, leading stocks since then. They're still on my list. They still look great. Yeah. If you own them, hold on to them. Goldman was a more recent pick. And when you talk about numbers, they reported their strongest quarterly numbers uh, last yeah. month, historically. And it's all about growth. So it's uh, interest rates for these kind of uh, bigger banks aren't gonna be as impactful. It's more about IPO, M&A, trading, and so forth. And I think they still have much more upside. Um, but as far as being more attractive relative to growth names, not so much right now. Yeah, Aaron or Daniel, any differing opinions from that? Um, you know, I my sense is that there is some more upside in financials, but I think the last thing you said, I mean, we're starting to see a little bit of a failure in momentum over there. Um, participation on my participation charts, um, overbought, kind of losing some of that momentum as well. I just think that, uh, you know, as far as sector rotation, I think financials are fine, but I just think there are better opportunities elsewhere, which is why currently I don't have any financial stocks on my list um, for diamonds coming up or even in the last, I think, two weeks. Right. Danielle, are we scared of financials? Do they still work? What do you think? No, I'm not scared of financials. I just, you know, when I'm wanting to look for an entry, I'm just always going to look for, you know, as much upside as I can get, right? And since mm -hmm. they're so extended at this point, um, I think the space is great. It's really strong. JP Morgan is one of my favorite picks in that space that I hold. Um, I'm definitely not going to sell, but I just, I don't think that, you know, putting money to work here right now makes a whole lot of sense unless we got, you know, a five to 10% correction in that sector overall. I just think that, you know, when I'm trying to figure out, okay, what are the stocks that I want to add to my portfolio this month? The sale that we've gotten in technology is, is just incredible. And so I, I'm a firm believer that tech is going to come back. I think that a lot of the inflationary fears and everything that kind of kept that sector muted um, I believe it's going to come back and it's going to come back strong. So that's really why I'm focusing on that area so much. Yeah. And I, I would say all of you illustrated in your own way, that benefit of looking at risk and reward. And when you think of it that way, right. I mean, the, there, there's just, you're, you're getting less and less upside opportunity. We've already had some of the runs that we've had makes a ton of sense. I'm also curious, again, thinking of what you didn't pick, which is always, I think an interesting thing to, uh, to consider. None of you went with Tesla. You had the opportunity to go to any of these EV stocks, no Tesla, no Ford, which has had a nice uh, jump higher, a, a gap higher in the last couple of days. When you're looking at something like uh, electric vehicles, particular, uh, particularly Tesla, and, I, and a number of you picked some, you know, some of the stocks that I would probably put in the ARK Innovation Fund kind of bucket, sort of the speculative names, but no one went with Tesla. Is there something that you would see on this chart that would make you more constructive on it? Or is there something that you see less constructive based on the patterns thus far? I know I came like this close to bringing this. <laughs> it was so, number six, I'm sure. <laughs> yes, so it was definitely on my short list. Uh, I like what Tesla's doing right now. Uh, the double bottom that's getting ready to form here. Yeah. The issue I have with Tesla is it just really hasn't gotten above that 50 day moving average. Um, it could mm. pose a little bit of resistance. We've seen it turn back there um, back in April. So, you know, I still like Tesla and, and honestly, the renewable energy space, I've been really interested in that. Um, mm. It's kind of consolidating now, but, um, you know, Tesla is pretty pretty tight with the renewable energies moves as well. Yeah, and I, I had GM on my list. I did mm. get shaken out of it. They did have good news today as far as their chip shortage. Uh, they are back to manufacturing. They're able to get back in. So it did have a nice downtrend reversal today. And yeah, we'll see. I know uh, Danielle Tesla is a simpler trading favorite. I always, <laughs> when I go into the trading room, it, it does not, it comes up at least once. <laughs> we, we love trading Tesla. And yeah. <laughs> it, it, so I would, I would agree with Aaron. I mean, I would say it was probably my number six. I did actually yeah. add shares of Tesla last week down at the 200 simple. Um, 
I, I'm a firm believer in Tesla, but I have to preface that with saying I, I have a Tesla. So I'm a little biased <laughs> and I'm, I'm, obsessed. <laughs> I'm obsessed. So uh, I, my opinion may be a little bit biased, but, um, I just, I just think that Tesla is the future. I think that, um, mm-hmm. everything that they're doing, a lot of it, I think it's overshadowed by, you know, Elon Musk's <laughs> commentary around Dogecoin and everything else. And in the background, I mean, Tesla is really just a revolutionary company. I mean, I, I think that in particular, their solar space is going to grow significantly. Right now, their solar revenue makes up such a small portion of their revenue overall. Um, mm. And, it, you know, it's really, really expensive. Their solar roof, solar panels, all that kind of stuff. But I, I really believe that, you know, in the next 10 years or so, especially with President Biden now, all the different initiatives he's working on, I believe that that space within Tesla is going to grow. And I also just think that, I mean, Tesla is light years ahead of Ford, of GM with their electric vehicles um, and with their autonomous driving. And so, you know, people were waiting for Ford to come out with the new, uh, what is it? The Ford Lightning F-150 and the specs Mm -hmm. on the Cybertruck are all significantly better And Tesla actually had noted that when the Ford F-150 specs came out, they got a huge rush in orders. They have a million Cybertrucks on order, something crazy. And, you know, people only had to pay $100 to reserve it. I get it. Maybe they'll cancel, whatever. We don't know how many people are actually going to buy Cybertrucks yet. Um, But I'm just... I'm a huge believer in Tesla and with the pullback that we've seen in it, I'm willing to add shares at this price. I would add all the way down to 400 too. Hopefully we hold this level and go higher from here. Um, But I just think that, you know, this is a company that gets a lot of news attention and it's really volatile, but I think in the long run, it's, it's going to be, it's going to continue to be a leading technology company. Yeah. And it's a major component now, certainly the S and P 500. So it's, a lot of eyeballs on it. Yeah, You know, it's funny. I used to, when I talked about the XLY, I would always say, if you're buying the XLY, you're really getting exposure to Amazon, Home Depot, and then everything else. And now I say Amazon, Tesla, and Home Depot, and then everything else, because those three now are, are huge components in the XLY, given the rise in Tesla. You know, Aaron, I'm struck by the fact that, you know, you p- potentially had the most speculative list in terms of going for cannabis stocks, which I think you know, I, I think for a lot of people that have been investing for a while, going into a new space like that can be super challenging. And and I would not to group cannabis and, and cryptocurrencies in one bucket, but, you know, I think they're unfamiliar markets to a lot of people. So they don't really understand how to do it. What What is it or what have you seen from some of those charts or what would you recommend for people, you know, with a new space that they're not familiar with? What would you see on the chart or what would you hear about them that would give you confidence that there's some long-term potential there? Well, like I said, I think the biggest, <clears throat> excuse me, the biggest one is that uh, the federal government will take it off schedule one. I mean, I think the minute that they let the cannabis companies use the banks and uh, this is just a huge growth area. And, and the beauty of it right now is that it's totally beat down. Um, I live in California, so I'm very familiar with the, the medical marijuana space and, you know, it, it's a money maker here, even without being part of the bank structure. And you know, once they're given that freedom, uh, of course, the price of it might go up, uh, the actual um, marijuana plant. But overall, I mean, it's maybe you're not that familiar with it. But just looking at that, the charts that I brought, I mean, all of the technicals are just really poised. And you give it some, some, uh, you know, some news. And it's just going to, it'll be one of those spaces. It's going to take off. I, I mean, obviously, I, when you invest in anything, you know, set those stops. But uh, I, I really am behind the cannabis stocks right now. Now, Mary Ellen and Danielle, I, I can't help but notice no real crypto. Now, again, save your, your overstock uh, component. But, um, you know, when you're looking at cryptocurrencies, I know that's where we get a lot of questions, a lot of interest from our users is is breaking down cryptos and all of that. How do how does a growing market like that that we've been, you know, it's sort of new for for everybody. When does that hit your radar? How do you think of it relative to other levers you can pull equities and ETFs in your in your arsenal? How would you think of it? Uh, I actually my very conservative play as far as uh cryptocurrency is a, is PayPal. P- 
PYWL, mm. uh, quite simply, among other attributes, the, the subscribers can trade Bitcoin. They can use Bitcoin for purchases. So they've seen a spike in subscribership and usage. So that is going to be something, a way that I would play that, if you will. Uh, again, something a little more conservative. Very good. Danielle, cryptocurrencies, uh, how does that fit into your thought process? Is it something that most investors should be avoiding because of the volatility or embracing because of the, uh, the, the, uh, the unavoidable future we're all aiming toward, apparently? So uh, I think it's such a double edged sword because, you know, the more I read stories about I just read another story today about, you know, uh, it was a flight attendant that put, you know, all of his money into Bitcoin. And it's so I always hate <laughs> I hate being on record, you know, saying, yes, buy Bitcoin, because I just the last thing I want is, you know, some a teacher to put their only ten thousand dollars into Bitcoin and have it, you know, go down 20 percent the next day because of a tweet. So it's, it's one of those things that I hate saying that, but I do believe that it's the future and I do believe that we need to be investing in Bitcoin, but it needs to be in a way that you know you have to understand that this is probably the most volatile space you know beyond like the weed stocks which i completely agree with aaron i think they're a fantastic investment right now um Thank i you. just think that yeah they're yeah they're great i have mj the etf and um mm. yeah it's been doing awesome i think you're right on about um, what you're looking at there but um i think that people just have to understand that this is something that you know you put money in it and you just you wait five years, you know, it's not something that you're going to be getting in and getting out of, um, you know, for example, my husband, I mean, he set up an automatic buy. You can set up an automatic buy on Coinbase every single week and not even worry about what the price of Bitcoin is. Uh, you know, small amount, not, not anything too crazy. You're not going to be homeless if it, you know, goes to $10,000. Um, but I do think it's important, important to be invested in it because Bitcoin's not going anywhere. And um, we definitely want to get some more, especially on this dip. It's interesting. And as we talked about each of those electric vehicles, cannabis, uh, cryptocurrencies, things we're all, you know, learning by. And it's amazing how much I've learned about some of these spaces that I never imagined I would. Um, but I think in all of your answers, what the, there's some truth in there of when the charts, you know, tell you that there's an opportunity to focus on it, right? When the chart looks attractive, that's when you think of something like cannabis because the charts compel you to uh, to do so. Folks, that was it. That was a quick hour. That went by really, really fast. <laughs> and I had so much fun hearing from each of you. You guys are, again, I, I think everyone was very rightly impressed by the rigor that you bring to uh, selecting charts and talking through them. You represented, I think, your expertise and your commanded the technical toolkit beautifully and uh, and I appreciate all of it. Um, Aaron Swanlin, Mary Ellen McGonigal, Daniel Shea, thank you so, so much, each of you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yes, it was awesome. Great. I had a great time. <laughs> great being so here. folks, that is it for the pitch. This is a, a three fantastic guests bringing their five stock picks as always, a stock picking showdown, all giving some different representations. You've got sort of the pro growth trade and the charts to back them up. What do you think should be in the uh, in the top five of your own list? Put us comments. If you're watching this on YouTube, put a comment right below the video and let us know. For StockCharts.com, I'm Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist. Thank you so much for joining us. Be safe. Talk to you again soon. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.